Hi, I'm Phil Ashey from the American Anglican Council with uh, this Anglican Perspective interview of young leaders in the Anglican Church in North America. And uh, today I've got the opportunity to interview uh, Reverend Chase Campbell, who is the Associate Rector at Christ Church Atlanta. You're what, what age range? 35. 35, okay. And you've got a wife and... Wife, I've been married for 14 years here in about two weeks, and we've got three kids. Lydia, she's 12 in seventh grade. Jude, he's nine in fourth grade. And then Rachel, she's uh, six going on 26, and she's in first grade. So she's our spitfire. All right, yeah. all right. Well, so tell us a little bit about how you came here. I, I guess the, the story begins with you getting called here to Christ Church Atlanta. And, and when was that? So we, uh, we, we got here about a year and three months ago. So just a little over a year ago, uh, we came from Tallahassee, uh, originally from Pittsburgh, and uh, we, we got the call uh, to come to Atlanta and be a part of this church, uh, and uh, it's been an exciting journey. And, and tell us a little bit uh, about Christ Church. Yeah, so Christ Church of Atlanta has been a, a I would say, a very long church plant. It's about 20 years, but we're still a church in a box. Wow. Uh, so we meet at a, a local school, and every Sunday we unpack, and every Sunday we have to pack it in. <laughs> Wonderful folks, we're about 125 on a Sunday, so we're about that medium-sized church, uh, and uh, very faithful, evangelical people. The thing that uh, really uh, inspired myself and, and my wife Jamie to come here was the story and passion of Christ Church. Uh, this church started out of St. Philip's Cathedral, and there was a, a strong desire uh, to stick firmly to the gospel and to see the gospel spread through the city uh, and to be a beacon of hope and light in this end of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just loved uh, how much people were um, devoted to scripture and sharing the gospel, and so we wanted to be a part of that story. Would it be fair to say that, that you've discovered that there's a, a lot of really sweet and wonderful things about being in a smaller congregation? Absolutely, yes. Um, so, uh, first off, it's, very, it's much easier to get to know everybody on an intimate, personal level <laughs> yeah. when, when, you know, you, you're, you're just, everybody goes to one service. Uh, yeah. and. Uh, it's easy to go to people's homes uh, when you only yeah. have 125 parishioners to visit. And so uh, it's been a lot easier to get to know people and build relational capital with these folks. Um, you know, I, I probably had a good relationship with maybe 10% of the people at our last church where I, I think it's very different here. I'm, yeah. you know, half of the yeah. people I know very well um, and the other half, I, I, I at least know who they are and, and a little bit of their family background. I couldn't say that parish. So it's been great kind of feeling more or less in a community uh, environment. I mean, truly. And that is a wonderful thing yeah. about, about smaller congregations. Now, I know that you were called uh, with the hopes of building up um, ministry to young families and children and youth. And so you'd been here for, I don't know how many months before all of a sudden you know, COVID-19 hits. Yeah. So tell, tell, tell us a little bit about how, how things were going up until COVID-19. You're right. Uh, so in my interview process, I, I asked them, what are your big goals? And the number one thing is we need to bring in young families. Uh, we recognize that we're an older congregation and our neighborhood demographically isn't that old. So we, we know that we, we can be ministering to this portion of the population. Were there very many young families in the congregation when you arrived? There, there, there were some families, not a lot. Uh, um, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, people said, we don't have any. And then when I started looking through the roles, uh, I, I, I noticed, no, there are some young families. We just need to call them to be more active. Uh, we need to call them to bring their kids to church uh, and to engage them. And actually, when I started to be intentional with reaching out to those folks, hmm. we, we did have... Uh, those families start to invest and uh, that that was really exciting I mean we, we want to see kids come to know Jesus love him and have put their faith in him then we want to see them grow in that faith and my goal for all children is that they grow up to love honor and serve the Lord 
this can't stop on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. It needs to be an ongoing thing at home. Uh, and I think when I put that vision out there and when, when we kind of gave them an image of what we're trying to develop, parents got on board, and that was a big help. Now, was it just that one talk? or Because you talked about relational capital and building. Did you find yourself having to go out and meet with parents? and All the time. So once we got ourselves established in our home, every Sunday is an evangelism Sunday for us. Mm -hmm. So after church, we were inviting a new family every single week to have Sunday wow. dinner with us or Sunday lunch. Wow. And, uh, you know, my goal was to kind of also teach families how to kind of begin to have liturgy in the home. So we oh, wow. do some prayers and things of that nature. We'll go, I'll even show them, you know, how to do the prayers for individuals and families out of the prayer book. Hey, this is one page. You can do this every Sunday as a family together. Wow. Uh, and that, that time allowed me also to, um, to get to know these families personally. Sure. And to really, you know, have them get to know me, and I get to know them, and to, for them to see that I truly care about them. What, in your own leadership, um, do you do in terms of, of, you think about core practices or, or habits of the heart, whatever you want to call them, to, to cultivate that presence that you have and that, that love for the families? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've got to be praying for your families, right? I mean, yeah. and every day you're naming those families and truly be committed to that. But I think that's, if you're not praying for the people you're ministering to, um, your heart's never going to be in the right place. You do want to develop friendships and relationships with these folks. And um, that takes time commitments, having lunch with them and yeah. really, you know, being there when, when, when they call and, and when they need you and just being there anytime that, that they can. And yeah. so. so all of this is going on. You're laying this great foundation and then bang, COVID-19 hits and churches shut down. What, 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 what happened to what you were doing? COVID hit and suddenly this nice little program that we've been growing and developing and having momentum with and establishing patterns uh, was shut down. And there was this anxiety that immediately hit. Um, oh no, I mean, this whole thing just exploded and uh, it's, it's falling apart. I don't know what it's gonna look like when we open back up. Yeah. And uh, you know, we had a, a, a number of young families that were attending the youth group and the children's program, but not necessarily Sunday. And these families don't have a church home. They, they, they doesn't sound like to be a faith commitment there in the family yet. Right. So this is this is true evangelism. Yeah. Right? We're not just pulling sheep. Yeah. Uh, this is an opportunity to, to you know change someone's future and to let them get them to know Jesus. And this is great. Are they going to come back? I don't know. And so we we just started youth group two weeks ago, um, and to kind of get people excited, uh, we did a Nerf fest in our backyard. 5,000 Nerf bullets, and... Uh, was that with the, those those uh, baskets in there with yep. the little blue plastic? Those yeah. Nerf bullets. Nerf okay. bullets. We set up obstacles so kids can duck and dodge uh -huh. behind. Uh, and uh, we had a big Nerf fest, and, and we had 20 kids come out. Half wow. of those uh, kids I had never met before. So our, our the kids in our church invited their friends, and we had 20, 20 kids come out all together, 10 of them knew, and we had a, we had a great time. Well, the next question is, did those kids come back the next week, right? And the, and what's great was, yeah, they came back. And, wow. And um, they, they've been coming back. And so, it, you know, one kid came out the next week with a Nerf gun, and Miss Jan had to say, we don't do Nerf Fest every, every week. week. <laughs> but uh, that same kid this past Wednesday brought three kids from his school. Wow. And so that family's been completely uh, invested into our children's program and we're hoping I see that they've registered this Sunday for church wow. and so they're going to be with us on Sunday so it's been a it's been a great pool to have these kids come and then their families come to church and it's been a great way to evangelize so Chase you were saying to me uh, earlier that when kids come you actually give them a, a nickname yeah so 
One of the things that I've, I've learned in youth ministry is, especially when you have kids that go to different schools, and we have kids at all over the, uh, the, the map, private school, charter school, my kids go to the public school, uh, so they're not interacting with each other during the day. So you've got to create a community. And one of the <sighs> silly things that took off early on, I, I, this wasn't intentional, but everyone started getting nicknames. And so when a new kid would come, right away they'd want to know, what's this kid's nickname going to be? Uh, so everybody gets a Father Chase nickname. And it, I, again, I didn't plan this. It just uh-huh. kind of organically happened. But what I've learned is once you've gotten a nickname, you kind of get a, a special feeling like, oh, I'm part of the group now. It, it helps to create a, a community and a relationship environment. And right. so nobody is, is feeling left out. Everybody's got a nickname. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's personal for me to them. Uh, so they, they, we've got that relationship going on as well. You know, part of what you're saying, Chase, I think is, um, is a way of, of doing church that's really different. Um, I think maybe when I was growing up, it was all about, you know, behaving and then believing. And if you behaved and believed, then you belonged. What I hear you saying is the really important thing is to create the sense of belonging and lead them into the scriptures so that they believe and the behave piece will happen we'll get there that's right yeah the, you don't you don't change the action you change the heart yeah. and the way you win the heart is you you treat it with hospitality right you, right. you welcome this person in um, i mean i think hospitality is one of the keys to the, sharing the gospel yeah. when, when you open your heart to someone and you show them that you sincerely care about them, that you care about their soul. Uh, now, I don't, I don't say to these kids, I care about your soul, but I, they get it. They, I care about them. And their families get that I genuinely care about them. Uh, then they're receptive to hearing what message you have because it seems genuine and, and sincere, and they know it is. So, I mean, if you were the only person doing this, I mean, it would still be great, but do you find that other adults, other young families, are beginning to catch on in the in the, in the way that that you're ministering and you know, kind of doing what you're doing? Yeah. So I, I will say the struggle, since we're we are still early and we've kind of had that hiccup, is kind of the next phase or the next process would be. Um, leadership development and, and and working with the families to mm-hmm. see themselves as the priests of the home. Right. And they're they're the primary ministers to their kids. Parents are the ones that get the most face time with these kids and they're right. the ones who have the biggest influence. And so kind of getting parents trained to um, catechizing and teaching these their kids is, is going to be the next step in that journey. Part of what I hear you say is that you're helping them with that bandwidth challenge by actually going to them yeah. and inviting them for a meal, something they'd have to do anyway, Yeah. right? And, and which is a great modeling of the very thing you're trying to teach. So taking a small church uh, and really turning it from just sort of a, a, a focus on what can we get out of the church and our own needs to mission? There's this mindset that because you've retired in your vocation, you've retired from any ministry in the church. Yeah. And uh, so from the pulpit, I've, I've said, you know, you don't retire from Christian ministry. God retires you. And, and yeah. you know, that, that that's a permanent retirement. Yeah. Uh, so uh, until you're breathing your last breath, you need to see that you still have a job to do. And, and, it's, it's just constantly challenging and reminding people. Um, f- for the young families, it's, it's modeling this. Yeah. So we're, we're intentional with being you know, in the local school, being out in the community. Uh, I've, I've joined Rotary to be part of, the, of this sure. community. Any way that I can actually be part of the life of Northwest Atlanta. It's, it's a slow process. You've got to walk with your people. Don't get frustrated when they're not with you. 
Yeah. And you go, okay, let's try this again. And you just keep slowly being patient with them and, and modeling that, what you're hoping to, to build. Which really is yeah. the heart of a good shepherd, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. No, I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much. This has been another episode of Anglican Perspective.